Naturalization Service. You're watching a historic first on live television nationwide. This is the first time that a federal court has been seen on television. This is the appeals court of the Ninth Circuit meeting in a special session in Boise, Idaho. We're uh, picking up a feed from a local television station in Boise, KBCI, a CBS affiliate, brought into Washington via satellite and back out on the C-SPAN networks. Uh, it's a historic day in a number of cases, the earlier press conference by Justice Thurgood Marshall, and now a chance to see what it looks like inside a federal courtroom. You see the three-judge panel sitting in this courtroom. Also, uh, you should know that this is the Ninth Circuit, which has 28 judges in all. They are headquartered in San Francisco. They normally don't sit in Boise. They sit in places like San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, and Pasadena. We're going to continue to cover this particular session. There's one more case that we're going to hear. I want to thank uh, Lou Ketchum and Regina Hunter and also uh, uh, the people at uh, KBCI and Craig Arnold, our producer, who's based out in California, flew in quickly when the judge decided that they would open up this particular courtroom. The experiment, which is supposed to last three years, actually doesn't get underway until Monday, where we'll have cameras in Philadelphia at the courthouse up there where they intend to uh, have probably two district court uh, hearings available possibly for television, although we won't know until the last minute. You're not allowed to show the jury being selected nor the faces of the jury once they are selected. In the appeals court that you're looking at here, there is no jury, and so therefore there's not a problem with who you can show. We'll go back to this in just a moment. Uh, we realize that you don't have many facts in the background of these cases, and uh, this was a last minute decision here. We will have more information on Monday on some of the cases, but we thought you'd be want to be involved in a historic occasion, an uh, experiment that um, might or might not lead to the eventual televising of the U.S. Supreme Court. And this experiment going on for three years is uh, in a number of district courts and appeals courts of the federal system throughout the country, which we'll tell you more about later. But we start our coverage on Monday, by the way, at 9 o'clock in the morning from Philadelphia, where our cameras are uh, already being set up for those sessions in a district court in Philadelphia. Let's go back to what is another appeals court case. This one is an immigration, um, an INS, an immigration natural uh, uh, service, the, the INS service, uh, and this is Mr. Moyle of Moyle Mink Farms petitions for review of the INS's decision to impose penalties on him for failing to complete forms verifying that his employees were not unauthorized aliens. Go back to Boise, Idaho Live. Administrative subpoena showed her the administrative subpoena. Uh, I reviewed Mrs. Moyle's testimony, uh, and it, it appears that she did not actually read the subpoena, read, the doc, read through the whole document, but he showed her the document, and that's enough to show you the document. And after she, he showed her the document, she felt that she, had, she could do nothing else, and she complied, told Doreen Daly to box up the documents, and take them out of the office. In this case, w what's incredible is, is the fact that at the most, at the most, this administrative subpoena only, only allowed B Agent Baker to, if, if in this situation Doreen Daly had said, no, I'm not going to give you the documents, we would then get into an issue of whether or not, because she was a custodian of the, of the records, that he could, at that point, serve the subpoena on her and and, and demand that she get the documents, he may have been able to do that. But in this case, he used his subpoena like, it, like he could seize these documents, and he did, in fact, seize these documents and, and left the premises. This goes against everything that's in their rules and regulations. The rules and regulations are really clear. They're clear on the fact that they can inspect these I-9 documents without a warrant or without a subpoena. But it's real clear that when you're dealing with business people and in this type of situation, if there's a problem, then you serve them with this subpoena and, and all this subpoena, the most that this officer could have done with this subpoena is either he could have subpoenaed Mr. Moyle's documents to the INS office in Twin Falls, or he could have served this subpoena on Mrs. Dale, maybe on Mrs. Doreen Daly at the office and at that point in time, 
she would then have the choice to produce the documents and the only thing that she would have had to done is produce the documents at the office and she would be in full compliance of this administrative subpoena in this case i think the rub comes in what is mr moyles remedy in this case these documents were i nine documents and as as the respondent is cited in their brief and cited shapiro and its progeny that these are required documents they are required documents they're they're open for inspection but the petitioner would argue that in this case they're not being open to to inspection does not make them lose all of their fourth amendment protections against a blatant unlawful seizure which took place in this case if we get to the point that we find that there is some fourth amendment concept around these i nine documents then the next hurdle the court would have to overcome would be in this situation since it was a civil proceeding involving involving the ins and mr moyle in this circuit it's not clear yet whether the exclusionary rule under the fourth amendment would be applied in this setting i thought counsel it was fairly clear on the cases so far that does not apply in a civil setting at least i haven't found a ninth circuit case that came close to applying it in a civil case that's correct and in the in the ninth circuit there is not yet a case that has applied it but there's never been a case that really focused on the facts and that would apply to the policy of applying the exclusionary rule to the facts i think we have i looked at one case that the petitioner site i mean the respondent sites garrett versus lehman and that involved a port court martial proceeding and in that case the court looked at the reasoning of uh lopez and decided that in that this case if you took a the benefits cost versus benefits analysis that the cost would be so much more than the benefits in this case because in that case the officer the individual was was essentially being court-martialed and taken out of the out of the marines i believe and in 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 this case we can distinguish it because in this case it's essentially what we're what is going on is the ins is trying to penalize mr moyle wait a minute i don't quite understand your point the i-9 forms were found to show that mr moyle was improperly illegally um hiring uh illegal aliens no isn't that what the i-9's evidence was directed towards what the i-9 evidence in this case was directed toward was the fact that mr moyle had not adequately filled out the i-9 form not that he was hiring illegal aliens but the purpose of the i-9 form has to do with the immigration laws of the country uh in which there is an effort uh to not have persons here illegally work uh and i don't quite understand your position he was fined here and i i assume what you're trying to do is have the fine set aside because he failed to carry out these i-9s properly whether they seized him or didn't seize them the i-9s were improper correct correct the i-9s were cost to society is under the balancing test the cost to society is a person who violated the law will not have to pay the penalty that's the cost of society in the balancing test that was discussed in in garrett so i your balancing test how you apply it here i'm a little at sea on well i think that you have to the cost society is also the fact that if if this what i'm asking for it is to have this evidence excluded and i think you want suppression like we do in criminal cases i i want suppression correct and we have said continuously in the ninth circuit that suppression of evidence is in a criminal context and not in a civil context that is you may have other rule other uh penalties you may be able to find all sorts of ways that you can file lawsuits against the government for their actions but we would not allow suppression of evidence as one of your uh one of the arrows in your quiver now uh 
I would like to find out from you why we should change that rule today. Okay, the, the reason that I would argue to change that rule today is the fact that in every case that, that I have found that the Ninth Circuit has looked at this, it's been an unusual fact pattern. In other words, it's never been applied in a situation where, like the respondent cites their brief uh, case Smith versus Brock, where OSHA, where OSHA, by, where, where when, the, when the defendant or respondent or petitioner or whatever was in being trying to be fined for OSHA violations, that yes, in fact, the exclusionary rule would apply if all that OSHA was attempting to do in that circumstance was to correct some type of safety violation, then the exclusionary rule would not apply. And I would say in this case that what we have is they're trying to penalize, they're trying to pose a fine on Mr. On Mr. Moyle and it's not, and it, and it's for it's for past conduct. But then you want to go again. You go back and use this cost benefits analysis, Wait and the co you, uh, you've lost me. They want to penalize Mr. Moyle. Mr. Moyle is being penalized because he improperly filled out I nines. What you want to do is have that evidence excluded. Excluded, correct? Because the officer, instead of sitting at the office of Mr. Moyle and looking at the records, took them back to the home office and looked at them. And based upon that that we should impose the Fourth Amendment from the criminal context into the civil context and keep the government from imposing the fine, which clearly the I-9 records shows he should be imposed. That's the status of the case. Exactly. And, 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 but what I'm arguing is, is that when you use this cost-benefits analysis, you're, you're, you're putting emphasis on the fact that the cost is to society because, that, like the, the, the that Mr. Moyle had not properly filled out the forms and therefore he doesn't get fined. But there's also a cost to society in this case and that cost to society is that you've allowed an INS agent to totally, you totally go outside any form of procedure that is sanctioned by this court. He's gone outside of that, outside of that and that taints this court's process when we allow, when the court allows an agent, especially an administrative agent, to go out and use a, an administrative subpoena, which if you follow the history, the courts were, were reluctant and the Congress were reluctant at first to give them this power. Now that they have this administrative power, it, it applies in a lot of other federal statutes. Now you're allowing these agents to go out and use this subpoena in a wrongful fashion. And no, no I, I don't think we're allowing it. Of course, we're well, you're not allowing it, but if, if the decision came yeah. down that but, sanction... But, but, you know, the, what you want is a certain type of response from the courts. That is, that we would suppress and therefore set aside the fine. Mm -hmm. But your client is perfectly free to file a 1983 action um, against the... Uh, or uh, Bivens action uh, against these agents based upon his constitutional qualification, uh, his alleged constitutional violation. Uh, you have in another part of your case here there's said there's been a misconduct and abusive process. There are other ways other than the Fourth Amendment to pre protect your client um, against uh, a, a, an alleged Fourth Amendment violation. And my, my real problem, it, so it isn't that he can't receive some, that he doesn't have any way of protecting himself on the issue. The real point is, why exclusionary rule? And we have said before that there are other ways in the civil context for people who have uh, Fourth Amendment or other constitutional rights against them to protect that other than the Fourth Amendment. So we have not extended the Fourth Amendment to civil context. And I don't see yet why that rule should not apply here. Now, you, I'm just putting the hard question to you. I and I understand my mind the question, the case, yeah. But I want you to see exactly where the problem we're going to have to deal with when we leave here and start consulting on the case. And, and, and maybe I'm not making myself clear, but I guess the reason I think that it should be applied in this case is it is, it, this case is, is almost exactly similar to Smith versus Brock where the exclusionary rule was applied in a civil proceeding, where essentially all we have here is we have a situation where, not to be redundant, that, that there's a penalty being posed on Mr. Moyle, but also in this case there is, 
egregious conduct, misconduct, on the part of the INS agent, Scott Baker, who for some reason thought he not only, I guess in this point that makes it so outrageous is it just wasn't an aberration. It wasn't just one one time occurrence. He'd been trained to do this. And, and so that's the effect of the exclusionary rule is to exclude or deter this kind of conduct. And so we basically what you're, what you're saying is legal niceties aside, you would have us fashion a rule that in this factual setting, the evidence would be excluded so as, deter, so as to deter these agents from this kind of conduct in the future. Correct. These agents, INS agents, any other agents, administrative agents, who administer federal acts, because there are a lot of other acts where, like OSHA, for example, where administrative agents are allowed to go inspect documents. And that's why I think this case is an excellent case where it would accomplish that purpose is the deterrent effect against the conduct that, that took place in this case. Now, had this been an aberrant uh, event, in other words, he wasn't trained to do this, he just did it because of the, the unique circumstances, then we wouldn't need that kind of a rule. Well, no, I would still argue in, in, in that case that, that, you, that you, you would exclude that evidence, but I think that in this case the argument's even stronger because he was trained and it was intentional and he went out there ahead of time and, and he sees these documents. So you, I guess, uh, in substance then, uh, going back to early in your argument, that uh, you're saying that the consent which the, which the agent... Uh, extracted from Mrs. Moyle was a sham. That was, a that was his intent the whole time, and he simply got her to go along with his nefarious scheme. Correct. And he used his subpoena. And, and, and even if she consented to the subpoena, the most that he could do was ask to see the documents at the premises. That's all the subpoena said he had power to do. That's and they were prepared to give, them, to give him those documents at that time anyway, according to what you said earlier. In other words, he could have seen the documents on the premises, as far as correct, that correct, he was told. Correct, correct. And that's what they thought was going to happen. And he was going to be allowed to look at the documents on the premises. And, I, and, and in, this, in this area, in the, in, the, in the problem that the court may be having with applying to the exclusionary rule to a civil proceeding, there's a, I think it, that I've argued in my brief, there may be another way for the court to get around our, to if the court has problems allowing or applying the exclusionary rule to this situation would be the case of uh, securities versus EMS where the court begins a, goes into some explanation and begins to form a doctrine, doctrine where this court has an inherent supervisory powers over agencies which, remi which entitles them to remedy misconduct and in this case, uh, in, the, in this case, that's what I would allege. If the court has a problem excluding the evidence under the exclusionary rule, then this inherent supervisory power to exclude evidence or to fashion any remedy where the court perceives misconduct, the court then, and this, the court would not have to uh, not have to first find a Fourth Amendment standing and then move the exclusionary rule into uh, civil proceedings, but could in this case, based on, on the uh, conduct of these agents, find that this, this conduct was outrageous and it, and it, it abused the, the trust that's between the citizen and the government in this case and, and use that inherent supervisory power to exclude the evidence. To, uh, to ask just a crude question, counsel, what was so high-handed about this activity, this taking of the records? Uh, it was the egregious conduct to which you're complaining, isn't it? That's correct. And, and I think what's so high-handed about it is, is the court gets a flavor, if it's read the transcript, that there was there were problems between Mr. Moyle and Mr. A and well, the we, INS. Okay. We've studied this all case right. and we understand all those things, but and, and what's if, he high -handed, had sat there, if he had sat there in their office and come back after lunch and gone out for dinner and come back the next day, you'd have no complaint at all, would you? If, 
if they had, if I say if he had inspected the records right there on the premises, what would your complaint then be? We wouldn't have a complaint. The complaint is that you're allowing a federal agency, an a, a government agent who represents this federal agency, to circumvent all procedure set up what to, is to inspect. What is the procedure set up about inspecting records? Okay. He can go in and inspect the records on three days' notice. He doesn't need a warrant or a, a uh, subpoena. We're talking about all that Mr. Moyle has to do is produce and inspect. In this case, if, if he goes to Mr. Moyle's premises and Mr. Moyle will not produce the document or not allow him to inspect it, then he has his remedies. His remedies are to go back and get a subpoena. If he didn't already have a subpoena, he can go back and get a subpoena, serve that subpoena on Mr. Moyle, and at, this, at that time, if Mr. Moyle refuses, then he can go in to the courts and use the court process to get those documents. Do you have the number of that regulation which uh, specifies where the uh, records are to be inspected and that sort of thing, Council? Uh, yes, I do. I can well, get that. It's in, it's, okay, it's, it's in the regulations, yeah. and, and it's, it sets it out really clear. And for these reasons, I would ask that we've gone through, I would ask in this case to, to apply the exclusionary rule under the Fourth Amendment, but if the court doesn't want to move that far, this circuit that far to apply the exclusionary rule in a situation like this of a civil hearing, then to, to use its inherent supervisory powers and to exclude this evidence because this is definitely misconduct. Did you, Thank uh, you. raise the in inherent supervisory power in your written brief? Did I? Yes. Yes. Did you cite us a, a case where the Supreme Court has said that federal courts have <coughs> inherent supervisory power over federal administrative agencies as opposed to, to other federal courts? I have some problem with, with our power to supervise an executive agency. Because I remember when the Supreme Court was talking about applying the exclusionary rule to state court proceedings, they didn't use supervisory power as a ground there on the basis that the Supreme Court has no supervisory power over state courts. And I find it difficult to think that federal courts can supervise uh, federal executive agencies. Don't we get a separation of powers problem? Uh, I don't see that problem in this case. I don't know that I cited it. I think a couple cases, LaSalle and Powell, they weren't cited in my brief, the actual case, but they came out of the case of Securities versus EMS Government Securities, which was a Federal Circuit case, which talked about this inherent power of the Federal bench to supervise these agencies. And in that case, the facts are a little bit different in that case because it, the, the the subpoena was actually served on the individual or, or EMS government securities and then at that point in time they used the procedure set out to go in and, and, and uh, contest the, the subpoena but the court in that case also was looking at misconduct I believe of uh, IRS agents in that case where they had gone in under the ruse that they were just on an information gathering trip and uh, then they eventually brought back an attorney and that they had er, used this information then to gather uh, information that was eventually used to prosecute EMS government securities. And in that case, that's, this is where this doctrine began, that, that they had this inherent supervisory power. Is your inherent you. supervisory power included under, under issue number three? The Correct. Case? where you talk about abuse of process and misconduct. Correct. All right. It wasn't stated in the title. I just wanted to make sure. All right. Okay, Thank let's you. hear from the other side. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Robert Kendall, Jr., and I represent the respondent in this case. Before this court, there are three issues that were raised by the respondent. And the crucial issue that the court must decide first, whether substantial evidence 
supports the ALJ's finding that the subpoena dues taken in this case was properly served on petitioner. The evidence that was adduced during discovery, during the administrative proceedings here, clearly denotes that the subpoena was properly issued by the Immigration Service to carry out its investigatory inspection by statutory authority of the I-9s that belongs to Mr. Moe. Now, what has happened in this case, and it's clear from the record, that the agent did advise Mr. Moe, pursuant to the statute, 8 U.S.C. 1324A, that he would make an investigatory audit inspection of all I-9s to make a determination whether or not these forms were, were in compliance with the Employer Sanction Act of 1986. He was duly notified on a particular day that we would go out and inspect the fund. Upon arriving at Mr. Moe's mink farm, he was greeted by Doreen Doley, who advised that she had been given consent by Mr. Moe to assist the agents in any way they so needed to. Uh, Mr. Moe, whereabouts was asked, uh, he was on the premises. The record clearly reflects that she was told that she would handle everything for the agents that day. Upon asking for the I-9s, which the service has a right by statute to inspect without a subpoena, we do not need a subpoena to inspect the I-9s. What we did with the subpoena was to ask for additional documents in the form of payroll records, uh, recent hires from 1987 and 1988. We included the I-9s in the subpoenas because the agent did not want to inspect those on the premises. By statute or regulation, there's nothing to prevent the agents from returning to the office to inspect it. There's nothing in the regulation says that an agent must inspect the I-9s on the premises, contrary to petitioner's assertion. The regulation is vague as to that. Which regulation is it that counsel was asked for and he's going to give us later? Do you have that regulation? Yes, I do. I have a series of regulations concerning the administrative subpoena, also the duties, uh, the service of the subpoena. Just the regulation that deals with whether or not he must stay at the premises to inspect the document. There's no such regulation stating that. We have statutory authority on the 8 U.S.C. 1324, which provides, 1324A to capital A, which provides that the employee must maintain the I-9s yeah. for inspection by the service. I-9s are to re be retained in increments of three-year periods and one-year periods. There's no regulations or statute that says that they must be inspected on the premises. What did the, the subpoena actually uh, uh, shown to Mrs. Moyle said what about where the inspection would take place? The subpoena did not reflect the inspection, contrary to what Petitioner's Council stated. Prior to the inspection, there was a notice of intent inspection letter sent to Mr. Moore, advising him that on a particular date that the agents would be out to the premises to inspect. That's what the council is referring to. The subpoena only requested the production of particular documents on the inspection day, once the agents arrived. Now, according to the testimony of Ms. Daly, the bookkeeper, and also according to the testimony of the co-owner of the premises, Mrs. Moe, that they were under the impression that the inspection would take place at the farm. They had provided a place for the inspection, but the agent chose not to inspect there. They returned to the office, they inspected the farms, they returned the payroll farms within one day, and they returned the I-9s within two days of the seizure. This, this was actually a subpoena ducis tecum, was it not? That is correct. And usually, the usual form of subpoena ducis tecum says to the person addressed, you will have these documents at this place. That is correct. And there was no place in the subpoena? It was blank as to place? Uh, here, the administrative subpoena ducis tecum uh, only listed the owner of the farm, Moe's Mink Farm uh, and DBA doing business as Moe Mink Farms and the name of Mr. Moe. 
And upon arrival, this is when they asked for the additional documents and they presented to the bookkeeper. The bookkeeper did not know what to do with the uh, subpoena. She called the co-owner. The co-owner consent to service of the subpoena. The co-owner told the bookkeeper to comply with the subpoena. Compliance with the subpoena now forbids him from coming in and saying that this, this, this was wrong. They could have refused to comply with the subpoena. They could have said, no, you cannot have these documents. We could not have forced them to give us the documents at that point in time. We would have, as counsel has so elegantly stated to the court, would have gone into district court to get a some type of proceeding to force them, a contempt proceeding to force them to turn the documents over. The record is clear that consent was given. In fact, we even advised the Moles that if they wanted, we would return later to pick up the document if they were so numerous. And also, she said, no, we, we will comply, but we ask you one thing, and the record is very clear, that you will not take the current employment records that we are working on. Clearly, consent was given. Clearly, if they had refused to obey the subpoena or uh, had some reservations concerning the subpoena, Mr. Moe was on the premises. But the record reveals that they again advised the officers that Mr. Moe told Mrs. Daly to handle the situation. The bookkeeper was acting as an agent for Mr. Moe. So, and going back to my question then, the, the form that was served on, on Mrs. Moyle simply said produce the documents but didn't say where. No, it did not. Okay. It did so, not. So the recipient of one of those subpoenas doesn't know it's in, whether he or she is in compliance by producing them at any particular place. I think at, one can assume from the, the, the presence of the service since they were there to do an audit inspection and they advised Mrs. Moe, they advised the bookkeeper that the audit inspection would not take place there. They were going to take the documents upon the production of the documents back to the office. It was clear from the inference of the presence of the officer that they wanted them to produce it to, to the individual agents and in return the agent would take them back to the local office. There was no question as to is there a definitional uh, uh, difference as to where I, am I supposed to produce the documents. The inference is that the documents were to be turned over to the agents themselves who were on the premises at this time. Now, the problem that it seems that counsel is saying that, okay, you have a right to come out and inspect my documents. Even if you find violation, as uh, His Honor has stated, well, that's okay. But I do not believe that you have a right to take the documents off the premises pursuant to the deuce and take them, which we disagree. The, the purpose of the subpoena is to produce the documents. The purpose of the subpoena is to bring them forward in the normal sense. And, and we could have, in the normal sense, sent the subpoena out and had them to bring the documents to us. But pursuant to the statute, we will go out and inspect the documents there. Now, once the documents have been turned over as the ALJ so eloquently found here in this case, and there was no objection. He found that there was consent given. The remedy would have been for Mr. Moe to go into district court in order to get some type of hearing to suppress these documents then. Once he waived these rights, he cannot come into the administrative hearing and ask that these documents be suppressed. Nor can he raise an exclusionary hearing type argument in administrative proceeding. The law is clear all the way down from the Supreme Court and Janice through INS versus Lopez that in the civil context, the exclusionary rule has not been applied. And they have not seen fit yet to apply the exclusionary rule to civil administrative proceeding. And moreover, it would be ironic, especially in the context of a, a deportation proceeding, which has a higher burden standard of review review and proof, clear, unequivocal, and convincing evidence that the Supreme Court refused to 
apply the exclusionary rule to an alleged Fourth Amendment violation, whereas here the standards are less by preponderance of evidence, and counsel is asking this court to extend the exclusionary rule, it just doesn't wash in the government's mind. And if the Supreme Court did not feel that deportation is one of the harshest banishment that one can Im impose upon an illegal alien, yet they refuse to extend the exclusionary rule, but here for a civil administrative fine proceeding, he's asking that this rule be made an exception by this court, and they're asking this court to extend that rule. Now, he mentioned the Fifth Circuit case of Smith, where the Fifth Circuit partially extended the exclusionary rule to an OSHA violation. Now, what happened in that case is, is quite distinguishable from the case here at Barr. In that case, this, the OSHA investigators, without the probable cause, without anyone uh, giving them information that a violation had occurred on a work site, entered the premises and cited the employer with several OSHA violations. Based upon the criminal allegation, which the court found that this was suppressible, the information was suppressible because they did not have the probable cause of the administrative warrant to go there, OSHA attempted through the Secretary of Labor to impose civil penalties. And therefore, the court said there, oh, the exclusionary rule will apply, taking into consideration the language of Jester O'Connor and Lopez and Janice, saying that here we will make a distinguishing factor here because here they are taking a criminal violation which they found to be criminal and suppressible, and they are trying to circumvent it by using a civil fine proceeding. Here we have no criminal violation, straight civil fine proceedings. This is not the type of case where it's applicable for the, any type of exception to the exclusionary rule. And I, again, uh, adhere to the Supreme Court decision that no civil proceeding yet has been the proper basis for the, the application of the exclusionary rule. The third issue petitioner raised that, well, if, if the, if, even if the uh, subpoena was properly served, and even if the exclusionary rule doesn't apply in this case, I believe there are some misconduct by these agents because they didn't have a right to go out and investigate this man. The record is complete with factual, supportable information which the ALJ found to be credible. He did a credibility determination as to the witnesses were, that were there during the hearing. He found that the totality of the circumstances surrounding the whole event, beginning with the educational inspection of Mr. Moe's farm, immediately after the act was implemented, where Mr. Moe's testified and the agents testified that he was very uncooperative. This was a time when we would go out and tell you what the law was. It was a non-citation period where we would go out and explain the new employer sanction law to you. We would bring a handbook to you. We would sit down. It was a courtesy call to let you know what would be expected out of you in the future. The evidence of this administrative proceeding clearly revealed that he was very hostile. He did not want to uh, talk to them. And in fact, he told them he was busy. Could they come back at another time? Uh, the second factor that is involved in this case is that an anonymous telephone call was made to the Immigration and Service Office there in Idaho, which alleged at that time that there was a, a mole mink farm who was hiring illegal aliens. And they gave the name of the particular person who was supposed to have been working at the mole mink farm. Just so happened it turned out to be a different mole mink farm, but this was one of the bases. Uh, it happened to be this petitioner's brother's mink farm who has the same name. Uh, based on that, the agents did an, a surveillance investigation of the petitioner's farm. There he detailed and did an investigative report noting that he did observe people who were working who appeared to be illegal aliens. And how did he make this assumption? Based on his many years of working on the Mexican border, he gave a characteristic description of what he thought was an illegal alien. He also took down the very slicing place of cars from out of state. He went to the local sheriff's department there to run a license check on the cars. 
There he encountered a deputy sheriff who was also, quote unquote, an informant who had given reliable information to the immigration service in the past concerning illegal alienage in that vicinity. This individual, when he told him what vicinity he was surveillance, where he had been, he said, quote unquote, and, and asked yes, I know who you're talking about, that's the Mole Mink Farm, and I know that he has hired, uh, had problems with the illegal aliens in the past, and then upon questioning as to how did he know, he said, my daughter is married to the brother of the petitioner. Uh, also, based on the totality of the circumstances, the immigration judge looked at all, the ALJ looked at all of these circumstances and found that there was sufficient probable cause to do an investigation of the Mo Mink Farm. There was no abuse of discretion, contrary to what Petitioner's Counsel has alleged to the court, there was detailed investigative reports submitted, there was uh, uh, evidence uh, submitted, uh, even there was a cre credibility determination as to the informant's change of testimony that he did believe the agent versus the informant. Based on the totality of circumstances, the ALJ was correct in finding that Mr. Moe had committed various paperwork violations on the IRCA. There was no defenses to the paperwork violation, only as to the manner of the investigation, how the investigation was started, whether or not the subpoena was properly served, but the violations were there. And based on the totality of the circumstances in this case, you should affirm the decision of the ALJ. Let me ask you a question, Counsel. The first issue is the proper service. Counsel didn't focus on that. But let me ask you, uh, if in fact the nature of the surface is being questioned, what's the usual procedure for challenging that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your last part of your question. What's yeah. the usual procedure for challenging that? Uh, and uh, the major procedure, Your Honor, in, in respect, if the, the subpoena the was in... Service is improperly served. If the subpoena is improperly served, what's the usual way to challenge that? Well, based on my research of the case law is that uh, they first had a duty to refuse to comply with the subpoena. But well, they, once they complied, they waived any, 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 any that attack. That's my question. That was what you said before. My question is, how do you go about challenging the, the improper service? Don't you bring a motion to quash? You bring, yes. In this instance, had they wanted to challenge, they would have gone into district court on a motion to quash, not into the administrative proceedings. That's usually the way this comes up. I wondered, in, at least in my experience, I've seen quite a few of them, uh, and I just wondered, is there any other process that can be used when you challenge the, the service of the subpoena by the, uh, the, subpoena by the INS? No, for, to my knowledge, those are the only procedures that are available because by statute, uh, under 8 U.S.C. 1255A, you will notice in there that if the petitioner refuses to turn over the I-9s, that is the exact procedure that we would have to employ. We would and have to go into this. similar then to the uh, uh, administrative subpoenas that are served in the tax context. That is correct. IRS. Same process. Same process. What's, uh, what's the threshold uh, showing that the uh, service needs to make in order to go inspect I-9s if that's all they want to do? Uh, if you would take a look at the, the decision of ALJ, uh, he set forth several criterias that may be utilized that are found in, in the uh, immigration field, agents field handbook for investigatory audits of i nines. There could be a, a variety of things that uh, you could use. There could be uh, including uh, informants, uh, including... Uh, uh, but you need something other than just a desire to go look. Well... Or not. Yes. Now, under the statute, under 8 U.S.C. 1255A, Congress had dictated that the Attorney General sets up a, a, a some type of plan uh, we cannot just on the whim go out and say, I'm going to uh, sui sponte uh, do your I-9 inspection. But uh, 
we do have a right to do that. And, and there are various criteria that we could utilize. Uh, uh, what may be utilized for one farm may not be utilized for another farm, but we do have to follow the field manuals in that respect. And, and they are... Neil J. here found that, that the service had followed the manual, and your position here is there's substantial evidence in the record to support that. Position. That is correct. That is correct. And he did not commit aerial, he did not commit an aerial law in refusing to, uh, uh, in rejecting his uh, exclusionary rule argument, and it should be affirmed. If there are no other further questions from this court, this concludes my argument. Thank you. Rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Just a quick rebuttal. The Do you have the regulation before we forget about it? Yes, it's 8 Code of Federal Regulations 274A2 brackets B brackets D is in dog? B is in boy oh, right. bracket B two brackets two small I's in brackets. I got lost along the way. Okay. There, 274 <laughs> what? 274 a, a point two and then a small b in the brackets yeah. two in the brackets and then two i's in brackets now then let me read this back to you hcfr 274 a two bracket b bracket two bracket I, I. Correct. Thank you. Kind of a household phrase, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In rebuttal, I would just like to make a couple of points. One is, as counsel for the INS is arguing, went into a long, is arguing about whether or not the INS had to be out, had the right to be out in the presence of the, on Mr. Moyle's premises, we did not even address that issue in our brief. That issue was not even addressed. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting testimony as to what was said and whatever, but my understanding of the, the, of the, st of the uh, standard is, is articulable suspicion. Our, our focus is on the uh, outrageous conduct that was, took place in this case in the use of this subpoena in a, in a fashion that, uh, that I could find no other case where a subpoena had ever been used in this way. And in, as to one of the justices' questions, the body of the subpoena does have a place. I would direct the court to petitioner's record exhibit uh, of the subpoena where it, it, it states, in accordance with Title VIII, United States Code, Section 1225A, you are hereby commanded to present to an officer at the place, date, and time speci specified below documentation. What, and it, what, what page are you reading from? That is page 20, uh, 25, 20, I believe. 25 of the record, yes. Small oh, small it, okay. it says immigration to immigration officer Scott Baker, Border Patrol agent, date February 7th, 1989, place the offices of Moyle Mink Farm, 375 South, 600 West, Hebron, Idaho, and, and the zip code, the time, 10 a.m. And that's what this administrative subpoena Ducas Takem is saying. You have to produce these documents at that location. And that's what was in fact done in this case by Doreen Daly. Uh, whether or not service was proper or not is, is an issue, but even if, even if Mr. Moyle was not there and, and they actually, the service of this du subpoena deuces taken was, the court was determined it was proper, all that allowed to happen was for the agents to inspect these documents on the pres premises. He could not as the testimony I think in the record shows, when Mrs. Daly confronted him about taking it off, that's what we find is the misconduct and what's so egregious is he pulls out this administrative subpoena at that point in time and uses this administrative subpoena as though it's a search warrant and shows it to her and says this and Marta Moyle and, and says this gives me the power to take this document off your premises well, and that you, document uh, did you not. You gave me that uh, federal regulation uh, 
do you have it handy and can you read it? Is it short enough in that particular sub subsection that you uh, referred yes. to? I, I could read it. I have it. It says, no subpoena or warrant shall be required for such inspection. Any refusal or delay in presentation of the forms I-9 for inspection is a violation of the retention requirements as set forth in section 274A B3 of the Act. In addition, if the person or entity has not complied with the request to present the forms I-9, any service officer listed in 287.4 of this chapter may compel production of the forms I-9 by using a subpoena. That doesn't say anything to me at least about uh, where the inspection must be made. The, well, yes, the act is, is, is silent on exactly where the inspection to be made, but, but the point is that if you send out an administrative subpoena and in the body of the subpoena it says, I will inspect those documents on your premises, and you've also beforehand sent out a letter stating this is a standard audit and I'm going to inspect these documents on your premises, that, that doesn't give the INS agent, the federal agent, the right to go in and grab your documents and make some kind of a unilateral decision. I'm going to inspect those documents back at the INS office. If he wants them inspected at the INS office, he has proce proper procedure in which he can either subpoena them to the INS office or he could, he, I suppose he could send him a letter and say, we want you to present these documents, voluntary You're compliance. You're into the verbiage of this subpoena, counsel. It says here in the uh, first full paragraph, in accordance with Title B, uh, so forth and so forth, you are hereby commanded to present to an officer at the place, date, and specified below. That's as far as it goes. Present to the officer. Exactly, but in, in any administrative position, any administrative subpoena, all, it, all it's the ability to use an administrative subpoena for is to present documents or to compel testimony at a location. It does not give you the right to seize documents. An analogy can be drawn to the, the, the civil context in the, in the sense of discovery. If I send out a... a well, that's a, the implication you're reading into this, but uh, frankly, I have some difficulty uh, saying that uh, I regarded uh, that way. Uh, I've known situations where the material could not have been inspected at all. And the officer had to go out with a truck, for instance, to take the stuff in so he could look at it uh, conveniently. And, uh, I don't, I don't uh, read anything in what you referred me to that says must be inspected at the Moyle meat farm and no place else and not removed from the premises. Well, I think if the court looks at all the cases I have cited and all the cases that respondents cited concerning administrative subpoenas, and most of them involve the IRS, that in, in no case was an, a, an agent of the IRS allowed to walk in with an administrative subpoena and seize the documents and say, I want to inspect them at another location. That's, I mean, they could, that could be set up, that's a procedure that could be set up, but, but absent, absent some kind of, in this case, there was not any cooperation or consent given by the parties whose documents they belong to, to take them off the property. And but I think that... No, what do you mean there was no assent? Did they say, don't take the documents? They didn't say don't take the documents. They thought that they had to consent to the documents being removed to the, off the property because of the presentation of the subpoena deuces so taken. So no issue ever came up at that point as to whether or not the officer could or could not remove the documents. The no issue, issue came, up came up by just by fiat because they assumed they had to give up the document. That's but what didn't I remember. Didn't, didn't the officer not take certain documents that they objected to? In other words, they said, please don't take our current records that we're working on, and, and the agent said, fine, I won't take them. So the objection had some efficacy there. But those docu those weren't the I-9 documents. But they and there's other documents besides the I-9, isn't that correct? There were some other documents listed on in the subpoena, correct? Which were taken. In other words, the agent took documents other than the I-9. Correct. And didn't take documents objected to by Mrs. Moyle. 
the only documents that he didn't take that were objected to were the current month's documents. But that still doesn't give them the right to take these other documents. Isn't, isn't the real question of if there was an objection and they said you can't, you can't take those documents, um, then the court would decide it. But here, after they have allowed the documents to leave the premises, they come back later and say, you shouldn't have taken them. The counsel suggests that perhaps the issue has been waived when it wasn't asserted at the time. What's your response to that? I don't think that the issue was waived. Why? At, at, because I don't think that the issue was ever presented. I think that in this case, the way the, way the uh, officer acting on behalf of the federal government acted and presented the subpoena to her and said, I'm taking these documents. He didn't explain, I have a right, you have to produce these documents, I have a right to take them off. What she wasn't, you and you have a right then to... What case do you rely upon that says the officer has to explain those rights? I have no case in my brief that I rely on that... Right on the face of the document, you say it's, it's crystal clear that they can only inspect them there. It's right in the face of the document. If your interpretation is correct, why wouldn't they have to assert what you say is clear at the time? I think that they would have to assert that. And having not asserted it, but it allowed them to take the documents other than the current records, counsel suggests there's a waiver. And I don't think that there's a waiver. I think by fiat they have gotten these documents and that there was no waiver. There was no chance to waive any right. The documents are gone by their... In your um, inherent supervisory power argument, you rely upon the uh, Fifth Circuit case of Securities and Exchange Commission versus ESM. Um, in that Fifth Circuit case, assuming that, that it is the law or we would accept it in this circuit, uh, they indicate that there must be a fraud, deceit, or trickery. Where, in the context of this case, is the fraud, deceit, and trickery? Uh, I think that what that in case indicates is, and I think there's language also in the case, and they cite the footnotes, is they're saying fraud, deceit, trickery, and, 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 and the case did not just limit it to fraud, deceit, or trickery. Any kind of abuse that the court felt was an abuse that, that it required a remedy uh, on the part of a, of a government agent in gathering evidence. Any abuse? Any, well, abuse that rose to a level that the court felt that that, that kind of conduct should be deterred. That well, I just quoted directly in the case you know, that there was, quote, fraud, deceit, or trickery as grounds for denying enforcement of an administrative subpoena, close quote. Correct, but in the case it goes on, and, then, uh, and I've cited in my brief a commentary by a uh, commentator in the area of its administrative law, Charles Koch, Jr., who where this language is, that's not a limiting language, that there would be other situations a court would not be constricted to fraud, deceit, or trickery per se in uh, fashioning and a remedy or excluding evidence if they thought the conduct was in bad faith and outrageous under well, the circumstances. That may be what a commentary, commentary said, but I was reading what Judge Vance said. And, and I, I can't think of it right off the top of my head, but in the case, they go in and, and read on, and, I, I, and I'm not sure that that, w all I'm saying is I'm not sure that, that he was limiting the court to fraud, deceit, or trickery, that it was that narrow. Okay, thank you, counsel. Thank you. The case just argued will be submitted for decision. That concludes our argument calendar for today. We will be in business.
down to the court. But this court now stands.